Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen Hallelujah. It's wonderful to have you, have you all gathered here in God's house on this momentous day as we celebrate the fact that the tomb is empty, that Jesus has risen from the dead and brings new life to us. Our meditation today is going to be on Mark's account of the resurrection, and so we're going to uh, hear how that account challenges us. It ends a little differently than you would expect, uh, but it tells the story in a, in a way in which it invites us into it. And so we're going to look at that today, but we're going to begin with our call to worship.
in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing our hymn of praise. This is the feast.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God the Father, through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, you have overcome death and opened the gate of everlasting life to us. Grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of our Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine, well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the, world, to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, 
and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. 
please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us when, from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were terrified. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. We invite all children forward for a children's message. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy, Easter. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. And I really thought you'd outshine the grown-ups there. All right, well, uh, so there's been a box. It's been sitting next to our altar, uh, all lint, uh, that wooden box. Can somebody go get that for me? Go ahead. Will you get that box for me? So now, do you all remember, so this box has been really sitting next to the altar. You got it? Oh, oh you, he's got it, very good. All right, thank you, great. Now, do you all remember what's in this box? What was in this box? You remember? Does anybody help her out? What was in this box? Go ahead. Our hallelujahs, yeah, that's right, because we remembered uh, uh, Lent is a season of, uh, of, of sadness and, and repentance because we remember that it was our sins, our mistakes that put Jesus on the cross. So now it's time to let them back out, right? Yeah. So uh, can somebody do the honors and, and open the box for me? Go ahead. Where do they go? Where do they go? You all see, do you all see where the hallelujahs, they're not in here. Where'd they go? I know. Oh, they're up there. Wow, look at that. All of our hallelujahs that we put in the box. Boy, now they're hanging, they're hanging from the railing there. <laughs> and you know, God that's, that's right, yeah. So the reason they're not in here is because Jesus isn't in the tomb anymore. And do you think this is good news? Yeah. Do you think we should let our hallelujahs go all the way to the sky? Yes! Do you think we should tell other people about this good news? Yes! Do you think we should tell our parents about this good news? Yes! All right. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Yes, risen All right, kids, you really disappointed me there. All right, so <laughs> listen. Listen, I'm going to say, hallelujah, Christ is risen. And then I need you to say, he is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Okay, can we try that one more time? A little bit more joy this time. Ready? All right. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Very good. This is wonderful news that we know that Jesus is not in the tomb anymore. And that means because Jesus isn't in the tomb, he has life. And that means that each and every one of us who are baptized into Jesus, 
we share our life with Jesus. We have eternal life with him. Can you fold your hands and uh, let's pray to Jesus now, our living Jesus. You can repeat after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross and rising again so that I can have life. Help me to share this great news with everyone around me. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, kids, can we do it one more time? Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Very good. Awesome. Our service continues with, with uh, G- Christ Jesus Lay and Death's Strong Bands.
Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen Hallelujah. Such a fascinating greeting. Uh, what would it look like if we always greeted one another with a resurrection? Wouldn't that be awesome? So if you've been with us through this season of Lent, you know that this year we're looking at the Gospel of Mark. And if you've been following along with us, you know that the Gospel is, of Mark is unique for a variety of reasons. And one of the reasons is that Mark is the shortest of the Gospels. And so he's very selective in, in the words that he uses. And I'm not saying that Mark is like the children's book version of the story of Jesus. But what I am saying is that Mark is like your quiet friend who doesn't have a whole lot to say, but when they do speak up, you lean forward and listen, because you know what they say is important. And so as we've been following through the Gospel of Mark, you know that Mark, with his economy of words, is, is very selective in what he's going to tell you. And we looked several weeks ago at the fact that there are three times that Mark predicted, uh, that Mark has Jesus predicting, telling of his death his crucifixion, his resurrection. In chapters 8, 9, and, and 10 of the Gospel of Mark, three times he predicts this. And since Mark is, is a man who's, who's really pretty short on words, we can pretty safely say that if, if Mark records this three times, then Jesus was probably saying this a whole bunch. This was probably a regular part of Jesus' teaching. And he would talk a lot about the fact that he was going to suffer in Jerusalem, be crucified, die, and in three days he would rise from the dead. And so imagine being a follower of Jesus and hearing Jesus say this a lot. How would you respond? How would you respond to, to this story, this, this prophecy that Jesus kept saying about himself? Would you believe him? Would you trust that this is actually how it's going to be? Would you really believe that, that he was going to turn himself in and then, and then rise from the dead? I think all of us living in hindsight, having known the story, would like to say, yes, of course, I, of course I would know that. I would, I would trust Jesus. But I think Mark helps us wrestle with this question a little bit more. Wrestle with the fact of what does the resurrection mean for me? Do I believe it? Do I trust in these words of Jesus? And the way that Mark helps us wrestle with this story that Jesus keeps telling about himself and eventually does happen to him, the way that he helps us put ourselves into the story is he gives us several people who hear this story of Jesus, hear these words of Jesus, and he shows us how they respond. And what's really fascinating is Mark actually bookends his passion narrative in chapters 14 and 16 with two stories that are very similar. And so I want to share those stories with you, and I, I want you to ask yourself, would I trust this story of Jesus, would I believe in the resurrection? The first story that Mark tells us in Mark chapter 14 is, is about a woman. We don't know much about her, but we can see her walking through the street, clutching this, this bottle, this flask of ointment. It's it's beautifully scented. She's clutching it to her chest because this little bottle of ointment is worth her entire life's savings. In our day, 60, 70, maybe $80,000, her entire life's savings. And she's clutching it to her chest and she's walking down the street, going to the house that she knows that Jesus is in. And as she's walking to the house, she's thinking to herself about these words of Jesus, his, his preaching, his, his teaching, the amazing things that he's done. And she's thinking about, about those peculiar words that Jesus keeps saying, that he's going to die, 
and three days he's going to rise. She knows that Jesus is going towards Jerusalem. The Passover is right around the corner, and, and Jesus will be there, and, and everyone knows that the tensions between Jesus and his political opponents is, is rising to a fevered pitch. She knows that Jesus' end is near, that if she is ever going to give a gift to her king, now is the time. And so she walks through the streets carefully holding this bottle that, that contains her entire life savings. She enters the house, pauses for a moment, wonders for just a brief moment what the people sitting in the room will, will, will think of her. Because this is, this is all she had. But it is a gift fitting for a king. She enters the house. Jesus is reclining at the table. And her plan is to anoint him with this costly ointment. And she knows that, that just a few drops will do. She knows that that's all, it's take, all it will take to, to anoint him because it's, it's powerful. It's expensive. But she knows that, that for a king like Jesus, just a few drops to anoint Jesus before his death, that's not enough. And so what she does is she walks up to Jesus and she breaks the flask. And she pours it all over him anointing his body beforehand for burial. The disciples in the room, they, they see this, this 50, 60, 70, 80,000 dollar ointment that is completely used up, completely, completely uh, poured out, and not even the bottle is worth anything anymore. And they start to scold her. What are you doing? This, this, this could have been sold for a lot of money and given to the poor. You could have sacrificed yourself in another way. But that's when she hears those words of Jesus. Jesus looks at her. And in a way, his, his look says, thank you. Because you have anointed my body beforehand for burial. That's the story that begins Mark's passion narrative. And it's interesting that the story that ends Mark's passion narrative is in a way a lot like that story. This time it's not one woman, one woman but it's three women. The night before, Saturday night after sundown, they, they went out into the market to procure themselves this, this ointment uh, because, because they hadn't had time to anoint Jesus' body for burial. And so they gathered up all the money they could scrounge together and, and, they, and they, they purchased this, this very expensive ointment and they go to the tomb clutching it carefully. And as they walk, they, they think about the events of the day, the events of the last few days, the brutal murder of Jesus on the cross, his death. They think about the things that Jesus said and all the time, the, the, the teachings that, that he had, that, that, he would, that he would die. But in three days, he would rise. They didn't know what to make of that. So they pushed forward towards the tomb. And you know what happens when they get there? The words of Jesus were true. 
the words of Jesus that they had doubted, the words of Jesus that they did not believe, this, this oil that they had planned to pour over his body to anoint it for burial, not needed. These two jars to us testify to the way in which we interact with this story of Jesus. Do we believe it? Do we trust this story? Or do we doubt it? Do we walk towards the tomb in unbelief expecting a dead Jesus? And as we wrestle with this question, wondering whether or not we actually have faith in this story, wondering whether or not Jesus' body is actually in the tomb, I have a piece of advice. Don't look inside yourself. Don't look to yourself to see whether you believe or trust these words of Jesus. You see, there's a reason that this trust, this promise of Jesus, is something that is outside of you. There's a reason that you all are gathered here to hear this very same story that these women heard. You hear this story, and it is something outside of you. Because the challenge is, is when we look in on ourselves, we think, well, maybe I know I, I trust this Jesus if, if I sacrifice a lot. But both of these women sacrificed a lot. One believed, one didn't believe. And so it's not self-sacrifice. It's also not emotion. You don't know whether you trust this story about whether you feel really good about it, whether you respond to Alleluia Christ is risen with this, with this great gusto. Those aren't the things you look to either. Rather, you simply hear this story of Christ and you trust that it's true. Because when you hear this story of Christ, of what he's done for you, that he dies on the cross and in three days he rises from the dead, the Holy Spirit is already working in your heart. The really interesting thing about these two bottles that's, that's helpful too is that it's interesting that, that this woman had faith, faith to believe that this gift was worth it, faith to believe that, that her whole life savings was worth being poured out for Jesus, and all she was left with was a, a broken bottle. And the broken bottle reminds us of, of our own life, of the fact that we are broken, of the fact that we've done this to ourselves, and the fact that it's empty reminds us that we are empty. But the broken bottle also points us to the fact that on the cross, Jesus was broken. On the cross, his entire life was poured out. But the end of the story is a bottle that's full still full of those burial perfumes as a reminder that because Christ has risen from the dead, because he has taken his life and filled it back up, that this is our hope. This is our restoration. This full bottle is our full life. And when you see this transformation, what does that do to you? One of the incredible things about Mark's gospel is that it really seems like it ends at Mark 16, verse 8, which is the women walking away from the tomb, 
not having seen Jesus yet. All they have is the words of Jesus which say, I'm alive. Go and tell my disciples and and I'll meet you in Galilee. That's all they have. They have these words of Jesus. That's all they have to trust. And you know what? That's what we have too. We have these words of Jesus. Jesus who proclaims to you, you are my children. Because I live, you also will live. And we can trust them because he has been raised from the dead. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia. We stand to confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, you kept your promise and delivered up your own Son to be our Savior. By his sacrificial death, our sins are forgiven. And by his rising again, we have the hope of everlasting life. Keep us in this holy joy throughout this Easter season and all our daily lives that we may not fear our enemies, nor give in to the temptation of despair in our days of trouble. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us hold fast to the word preached to us, that receiving it with joy, we may take our stand in it and be saved by it. Hinder all who would sow doubt into our hearts, and grant us courage to confess its truth in our life and conversation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless Joseph, our president, and all who make and administer our laws. Frustrate the forces of evil, and do not let our leaders cooperate with them or further their goals. Guard our armed forces as they stand watch for us at home and abroad. Let them serve with honor and integrity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Have mercy on the sick and those in any need. Especially today, we pray for Mark Mueller, Dave Dawson, and Mikey and Wanda. We also give you thanks for the baptism of River Grace to Schluzi, which will take place during the 1045 service. Let the dawning light of the new creation in Christ sustain them in faith. In accord with your will, grant, that re- grant them renewed health, a foretaste of their eternal healing in him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us joy in your son's great victory feast as he shares it with us from this altar. In the eating of his true body and the drinking of his precious blood and faith, overcome our sin by his forgiveness and swallow up our death in his life, that we may be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We praise your holy name, O Lord, for all your servants who have departed this life in faith. We pray that you will not abandon us to Sheol, but that when we awake in the resurrection of all flesh, your presence will give us joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We join today in singing eternal alleluias with innumerable angels in festal gathering, with the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, and with the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And we bring these petitions before you, dear Father, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as our offerings are gathered. We sing our offertory hymn, O God, O Lord of heaven and earth.
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. What a blessing it is to have so many people in church with us this morning celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, because there are so many people, we're actually going to need you to leave behind your bulletins uh, for the next service. So if you could, uh, go ahead and place them on that back table back there. That way the 1045 can have some uh, for them to take as well. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. We sing our hymn to depart. I know that my Redeemer lives, LSB 461.